On behalf of our entire Gamma Knife team, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webcast about the new Gamma Knife Perfection here at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center. Today, we plan on reviewing with you the steps that it takes to treat a patient with Gamma Knife Radio Surgery. We plan on reviewing the indications and advantages of radio surgery and actually walking through with an actual patient as they receive their radiosurgical treatment. The Radiation Oncology Team at the Comprehensive Cancer Center at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center has a long history of excellence in the delivery of radiation therapies. Home to the first gamma knife in North Carolina, the Stereotactic Radio Surgery, or SRS, team is among the most experienced in the country. Since 1999, they have treated nearly 3,000 patients with gamma knife. The SRS team recently added the latest technology to its cadre of treatment tools. The Lexcel Gamma Knife Perfection, the most accurate and advanced stereotactic radio surgery technology available, is now available at the Comprehensive Cancer Center. The Gamma Knife is a device that delivers 192 gamma ray beams uh, from all around and they focus at a point. It's a brand name for delivering stereotactic radio surgery, which would be the generic name for that technique of focusing radiation beams on a, on a target um, in a single session. Basically, there's two types of um, tumors that we treat in, in the brain. Uh, we have malignant tumors, and the main type of malignant tumors that we treat with Gamma Knife are patients with brain metastases. So, um, you know, the most common types of tumors that go to the brain are lung cancer, breast cancer, melanoma, uh, kidney cancer. Um, but not everybody who gets um, a brain metastasis is a candidate for radiosurgery. First of all, the, the tumor has to be small enough to be treated with radiosurgery because if it becomes too big, the potential for side effects starts to rise. And second is if, if a patient has like 10 or 12 metastases in the brain, that's a sign that there are likely more to come. And Gamma Knife is very focused. You, you focus right on what you see. And if there's a thought that there are more to come in the near future, the patient's likely better off being treated with whole brain radiation. The, the, the big advantage of Gamma Knife, however, is one is that the response rate's a little bit better than with whole brain radiation, and two is that it doesn't have the side effects that whole brain radiation has, and that it should not cause hair loss, it should not cause um, uh, uh, significant fatigue, and mainly in the longer term, it really should not cause that neurocognitive decline, you know, memory loss, concentration difficulties that can be seen with whole brain radiation. We're going to put some cotton in your ears, and that's just to serve as padding. The padding is because uh, these ear pieces that we're going to use to steady the frame sometimes get a little bit tight uh, in there. It'll torque a little bit and get tight in one ear or the other. If it gets tight in your ear, just let us know, and that's a sign we don't need them anymore. We'll just take those out of there. They're, they're just to steady things, though, right at the beginning here. So we're going to try it on for size, and the best way to think about it is just like you're getting your hair styled here. And they comb and I forgot my comb. It looks good. I, I'll tell you, it looks like you went to the stylist this morning. But now, if you if you like what we do, the complete line of Dr. Tatter hair care products is available up in the gift shop. It's uh, you can just tell them you had Gamma Knife, and they'll give you a discount. You do a discount. So I don't want that to. We'll just adjust a little bit here. The next thing is an alcohol wipe. We never lose anyone from the alcohol wipe. Just get all the different layers numbed up. This is a mixture of two anesthetics. One is fast acting and one is long lasting. Here it goes. In through your nose. Good. I'm hard headed, I guess. <laughs> There are lots of, of layers to the scalp, and we just we want to get everyone numbed up so it doesn't feel sharp. It'll still feel real tight as the frame goes on. People will sometimes ask why we couldn't find one in their size. But that tight feeling passes quickly um, once we stop tightening. I say we, but it's, it's really me. Is that a little better, not, not sharp now? Feels better. 
We're not in a rush for this part. And is one ear worse than the other, or are they both about the same? All right, well, it won't be long before we'll be able to get that out of there. And if this is sharp at all, just say. Yeah, coughing is good. All in all, don't worry about that. So um, we're uh, placing a, a, a frame that sometimes we call a halo or a stereotactic frame, and it is um, serves as our frame of reference. So it does a number of things for us to allow us to make use of the tremendous precision of the gamma knife. Um, it'll, we'll be able to determine where every point is in an MRI scan or a CT scan or an arteriogram um, in relation to the frame. And then it'll also allow us to hold uh, Mr. Melton still and to position the target, the tumor, at the center of the 192 gamma ray beams where they intersect inside the gamma knife. So the, the frame does a lot of things for us. It's held in place by four things that look just like a ballpoint pen. Uh, that we call pins, and they're threaded back and back, but not threaded the part that actually goes in uh, to the person, and they go through the skin, and they uh, rest on the bone. They don't go into the bone at all. Um, so they, they make a little tiny nick in the bone, but, uh, but they don't actually go into the bone. It's, be, it's because they're coming from four different directions that they, that they work, and they hold the frame very securely. Because that's, again, really the basis for the whole procedure is that the frame won't move in relation to the target. And uh, that's what allows us to take advantage of the two-tenth of a millimeter precision that the gamma knife gives us. Uh, no, nothing else not should going, be sharp now. He's not going for that. And if you feel anything sharp, you just say, and we'll get it numbed up. This is going to get tight. Right now, there. how long is this thing going to be on? It's on till the end of the treatment, so you'll have it during the MRI scan. Then what we're going to do is is we're going to develop the plan. Um, in the plan, um, not no, <laughs> that's the frame settling. Um, the the plan will take as long as we need to develop it, but it's where we superimpose those spheres of uh, gamma rays, we call them shots, um, on the target, on the tumor that we're treating. And uh, we will develop that plan, and then we'll get you in here for the treatment. And the treatment will probably take less than an hour. And so a fair amount of the time we'll be waiting which is really while we're working on the plan. <laughs> the next thing we're going to do is put this space helmet on. And this allows us to make measurements. The measurements do two things for us. They allow us to uh, determine whether your head is going to bump into anything inside the gamma knife. The computer makes a model of your head from these measurements. And they also allow us to adjust for the absorption of gamma rays. Um, on the way in. They're absorbed differently by air and by other things. Not a lot differently, but this uh, allows the computer to make an adjustment so we get the dose that we want at the target very precisely. Zero is 84. A1 is 89. A3 is 82. A5 is 79. A7, 98, B2, 86, B4, 72, absolutely, B6, 97, that's a good one, B8, 106, C8, 104, D1, 83, D286. I could have told you all that if you were just asked. <laughs> That's right. And if you can calculate your hat size from that if you remember all those numbers. And I'm not sure just what the formula is. Left anterior is 120 and the pin zero. Right anterior is 120 and the pin is zero. The posterior 50 and the pins are zero. So I don't, I don't have a cone head. No. 
but we're gonna we're actually gonna put a cone head on. Whoa. This is something called a clearance yeah. check, and um, we just uh, that just goes on for a second. Just to again, it's a double check really to make sure that there's not gonna you're not gonna bump into anything in the gamma knife and their oh, clearance. Blurry. Yes, <laughs> you wouldn't want to wear that to play football in. And then when you're in the MRI scanner, uh, you'll, this um, fiducial box will be on. And it attaches very precisely into the frame. And it'll, uh, it'll be secured there. And it has these channels in it. And the one that you'll have on in the MRI scanner, the channels are filled with a copper sulfate solution. And the copper shows up really well in the MRI scan. So the MRI scan will make images of slices. And uh, because these go up perpendicular and these go up at an angle to the frame, uh, they'll show up as dots. And it's just trigonometry to figure out then where, where every one of those dots are in relation uh, to the frame. And in fact, where every point in the MRI scan is in relation to the frame. So this will only be on during the MRI scan. And uh, we don't, don't need it for anything else. When we uh, deliver radio surgery, one of the things that we need to assure is um, precision. And so, when the patient, after the patient gets their head frame placed, um, they are going to be fixed into position. You know, no matter if they fall asleep, no matter if they um, sneeze, you, we know down to an accuracy of a tenth of a millimeter that we're hitting the right spot. And so, one of the other assurances of accuracy is that we get a high resolution MRI scan the same day with the head frame on so that we have imaging of the patient in the treatment position and with the head frame on. And so that is what has just been done. The other advantage of uh, the MRI is that we get patients from all over, from Southern Virginia, from West Virginia, from all over the state, from South Carolina, Tennessee, and oftentimes there's, you know, not all MRIs are cre created equal. And so, so, like ours is a 3T MRI, it's, you know, quite high resolution, providing good contrast between, and, and, and very good resolution, so that you can pick up brain metastases or smaller tumors that may not have been picked up out in the community. And so, the advantage of doing so would be that we can treat anything that we see that day, um, as opposed to have the patient come back in three months with a new one that might not have been seen, say, they were to have had a less quality MRI. So now that the MRI is done, um, the images come over to our planning computer. And so what, one of the things um, uh, is that the computer doesn't necessarily know what's a brain metastasis, what's tumor versus what's not. And so we as the, the planning team, Dr. Tanner and I, actually have to tell the computer. And the way we do that is we, we outline the metastasis here um, using the treatment software. And um, so basically what I'm doing here is I, I see this one metastasis and I'm drawing it so that the computer can now can tell what is tumor and what's normal. And then th what this will allow us to do is later on using a, um, um, a graphical model we can determine whether the treatment plan is covering all the tumor and also whether we're sparing things that we don't want to treat. All right? And so here I am right now just about finishing up contouring this single brain metastasis. And so one of the checks that we have um, to make sure that there are no other metastases is that uh, Dr. Tatter will look at the, um, th through the entire Im image set. I'll look at the entire image set. And then we'll also call our uh, neuroradiologist. All right, and so you have three sets of eyes who have looked through this image set just to make sure there's nothing new that's popped up since the last scan or nothing new that was missed um, out in the community if the patient had a less high resolution MRI. And so um, now that this metastasis is drawn, um, I will now place, um, uh, tell the computer how much radiation dose we want to give to it. All right, just want to 
what, what I have just done is enter in um, the coordinates that Dr. Tatter had measured just so that we know and can tell the computer um, where the patient is in relation to um, the, the, the space um, and coordinate um, um, that we created. Simple check to make sure everything looks okay. One of the issues with um, treating with radiosurgery is that we're giving an ablative dose of radiation. Um, and the bigger the tumor is, the less radiation dose we can safely give. All right, and that's actually quite an important um, uh, rule for radiosurgery. And actually, one of the big issues for having a well-trained team that has a lot of experience. You give too much radiation to a tumor that's too big, you know, the, the tumor will likely die, but six months, nine months down the road, you can have the, the patient come back with this raging radionecrosis, dead tissue, big inflammatory reaction that could cause permanent side effects or even require the patient to go to surgery. So, um, you know, that's one of the advantages of, of making, of, of a patient going to a, a team that is well versed in, in doing radiosurgery. And so we have dose guidelines for what we give a tumor and basically that's based on the volume of the tumor, so how big it is um, in all three dimensions. And so this tumor here, just by eyeballing it, I'm going to guess is going to be in our um, about 18 to 20 gray range. Steve, is that your your thought as well, all right. Yes. So, so I'm gonna say, but before I um, actually put in the dose, what I'm gonna do is the now that I've drawn the tumor, um, one of the uh, advantages of the software is it can now calculate out how big the tumor is in in, in terms of volume and 2.8 cc's. We have just in case our dose guidelines here and less 2.8 cc's. Um, so we're going to be pretty safe with 20 gray if that's okay with you. Steve. Great. And so, so one of the issues is that w w this is, Gamma Knife's a team sport and so we have um, you know, at least two doctors and oftentimes more uh, checking over the plan and discussing exactly what dose wants to be given. And what the consequence, you know, what the consequences are if you if you choose wrong is if you give too little, the patient can come back however many months down the road, and their tumor could come back, right? If you give too much, you expose the patient to the risk of radium necrosis. So it actually is is a, you know, this is where the art of radiosurgery comes in, um, and so places that have a lot of experience will have treated many more patients and have a a better idea of what doses to use and 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 what their dose guidelines are, all right? So um, now that we've kind of decided on how much radiation we want to deliver to this tumor to ablate the tumor, um, but to stay within the safe range of the normal tissues, now I'm going to place shots of radiation to cover the tumor, all right? So, and so this, this is looks like a pretty spherical tumor. I mean, a little bit ellipsoid, but, but in essence, pretty spherical tumor. So I'm going to start out with a, you know, we have uh, three different sizes of collimators. Collimators are the different holes in, that allow the radiation beams uh, to um, hit the target. And basically, depending on the size of the collimator, that's the size of the beam, all right, and the size of that intersection point of the 192 sources that intersect at the tumor. So, um, I'm going to start out with 16 um, millimeters and see what we get. And as you can see, that's pretty reasonable in terms of... Uh... So another um, advantage of the software is that you not only can you see things in every dimension, but then you can ask the computer to see every single slide that has every single um, slice that has the, that has the uh, tumor in it. And the things that you can alter are basically the, um, 
the size of the collimator, all right, the, if you can put in multiple different collimators, all right, and you can, if you have multiple different collimators, you can um, vary how much each one is weighted. So for example, if there is a, um, you know, say you want to put a, like say we're missing really slightly here up at the top. So we could probably put a collimator uh, or, or put a shot of radiation up here, but weighted a lot less than the rest, which is um, you know really covering the rest of the tumor, and 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 in doing so, um, um, really shape this radiation dose. So let me show you, for example, what I, what I mean. Um, so this is the um, this circle you see are going around. Um, the tumor is the prescription isodose line. So basically this is the, the line that going around the tumor that we're giving our radiation dose to, all right? And so we want this line, that we call this the margin dose, to conform, you know, as good as possible to the shape of this tumor, all right? The more the tumor, or the more the radiation dose goes outside of the tumor, the more normal tissue gets exposed to high doses of radiation. Whereas if this line is inside the tumor, that means some of the, some of the tumor is not getting the adequate amount of radiation that we're trying to give it, all right? Because this is, a, this is a small area as opposed to the rest of the tumor, I'm actually going to place a, a, a less weighted shot. And in, in basically what the less weighted shot means is that the, the radiation um, will be will be being exposed to the tumor for a less amount of time for that shot. So, all right, and so as we can see, that did pretty well. So we're now, we've now covered a majority of this, but I, you know, it, when, we're, when we deal with radiosurgery, oftentimes the, the doctors tend to be very anal retentive, very detail oriented. So even though this looks better than it had been, you know, I'm, a little, I'm going to change it a little to see if we can improve on that. And so here's how, so, so what we can alter are a couple things. We can alter the weight of the shot. So if here's the weight, I'm just going to um, dial it up slightly. And as you can see, the yellow grew a little bit, all right? And, uh, you know, it still looks like we might be missing slightly, so I'm going to dial it up even more. So this yellow line right here, all right, let me show you exactly what I mean. So as we're changing the weight of this shot here and increasing the weight of the shot, this yellow line will grow to cover the rest of the tumor. So the radiation dose. It's the 50% dose, the tumor that's getting half of the maximum dose. Um, and that is where the fall off is the steepest in the gamma ray beams at the 50% the isodose line. So that's what that yellow line represents. And, and the, the goal of the planning is to really get, uh, the, get that yellow line um, to encompass the entire tumor, but not to encompass any unnecessary normal tissue. And we call that conformality. And, and that's where the, the gamma knife really uh, shines is in our ability to tailor the plan very precisely to the individual uh, tumor uh, that, that we're treating, the individual lesion, because some of the things we treat are things other than tumors. Um, the, the, we can, uh, with the new uh, gamma knife perfection, we can actually make changes in tenth of a millimeter increments. So with our old gamma knife, it was great. We could do a half a millimeter. Um, but now it's just routine for us to use a tenth of a millimeter accuracy with the new unit in the, in the new software. The, it, and it really is that combination, the, the software um, has been honed uh, to allow us in real time, just as soon as we make a tenth of a millimeter change, we can see what effect that has on the plan uh, to tailor uh, the, the plan um, to exactly the lesion or lesions that we're treating. So um, here I've placed several more shots and I can see that um, from all three dimensions, we're getting pretty close to covering this, the entirety of this lesion. I think really right here at, this which would be the top of the lesion, 
um, we're missing slightly. So I'm going to add a couple more shots. And as you can see, this yellow line is the, the, the prescription radiation dose. That's, that's what we're delivering radiation to. And some of this tumor that I draw is outside of the line. So if you watch and I place a shot of radiation right there, it grew and now it is practically covering the entirety of that um, um, lesion uh, or that's, that slice. The, the term gamma knife is a little bit misleading because of course we're not really cutting anything. Um, the, I think the term is accurate in uh, one way that the precision that we're delivering the beams with is about two tenths of a millimeter. That's the mechanical accuracy of the gamma knife. And the, if, if you were to give me a scalpel and tell me to stay on a line, I couldn't do it if it was two tenths of a millimeter wide. That's, that's too small. So we're delivering the beams of gamma rays with the precision that we could cut with a knife. Um, but sometimes people are surprised. They say, oh, uh, I had gamma knife. Didn't you cut the lesion out? But that's not really what the gamma rays are doing. It's interesting what the gamma rays are doing. Every cell, including the tumor cells, has two strands of DNA in it. And they're held together by positive and negative charges. What the, what the gamma rays actually do are introduce what are called covalent bonds between the two strands. So now, before it was like taking, when the cell wanted to divide, it had to separate the strands, make a copy of each one. It was like taking a magnet off a refrigerator. Now it's like we welded the magnet to the refrigerator. So the cell physically can't divide. Uh, the cells, tumor cells and regular cells, don't have efficient mechanisms for eliminating those bonds, that welding that we've done. And in, in fact, Mike can, can tell us more, but I, I always uh, claim that the half-life of those bonds, the, the, the time that half of them would still survive, is more than 50 years. And so the effects of the gamma rays are almost permanent. Um, now, some cells could, uh, if we don't introduce enough covalent bonds, if one cell uh, can start to divide, and, and that's where we want to give the most dose that we possibly can. But we know our risks of gamma knife, the risk of causing the side effect, radiation necrosis, that we want to avoid are determined by the dose that we give. Unfortunately, the higher dose is more likely to get tumor control, but also more risk of radiation necrosis and the volume that we're treating. And that's where the conformality comes in. As we're making the plan more and more precise, more conformal uh, to, the, to the lesion that we're treating, um, the volume that we're treating is going down, actually. Uh, if we were treating unnecessary volume, we'd be increasing the risk without increasing the potential benefit. Mm -hmm. And that's why this part of the plan, even though it's, um, it's not uh, as exciting as, as some other parts, is, is really the key. This is, in my mind, the surgery uh, in a lot of ways um, uh, that we're doing right now because the gamma knife uh, will, will deliver this plan just exactly as, as we're designing it here. Mm -hmm. So we're getting pretty close to be finishing. And so basically, um, now it seems like we have our yellow prescription line dose covering the, um, uh, the tumor in all three dimensions. And basically, um, what I like to do is just make sure we're covering in all three dimensions. I have all the axial slices laid out in front of me, but then I like to scroll through the coronals and the sagittals just to make sure visually it looks like we're not missing anything. Um, but then just because to the naked eye it looks like it's a pretty decent plan doesn't always mean it is. So we need the computer to also tell us that the plan is sufficient. And so the way I do that is I go back to my measurement tool and I look at, we have um, in Gamma Knife a tool uh, that we call dose volume histograms. And basically it's a graphical analysis to show us exactly um, whether what we're wanting to treat is um, is treated sufficiently, all right? And so um, what I do is I click here on the metastasis. This is zero. Uh -huh. So the the things that. Um, each of these shots, we often call them, they're technically called isocenters, represents a certain amount of time that the, the patient is in the gamma knife and the beams are focused on that spot. 
So weight actually translates into time in the gamma knife. When we, we say weight here, but uh, the, the, that's going to be uh, the amount of time that the, the patient there is the equivalent of that. The, it'll, it's a proportion to the maximum dose that we prescribe, that Dr. Chan is going to prescribe a maximum dose of 40 gray. The 50% isodose line, the margin of the tumor is going to get 20 gray of gamma rays. And, um, and the, the time will be determined by that. But the time for each individual shot will be determined by its, its weight relative to that maximum. So we change the weight, the size of the shot, and the location of the shot or isocenter. And, and that's how we, uh, we develop the plan. We can treat more than one lesion. If someone had more than one metastasis or more than one meningioma, um, there's so little overlap because uh, with 192 beams coming together, if you're treating a lesion that's just really just a few uh, millimeters away, the, the chance of intersection is small. And so there's very little interaction between one lesion and another lesion in terms of the total dose that we're giving. The, the total dose to the body that we give in a gamma knife treatment, if we exclude the target, is actually less than the dose that you get from a whole body CAT scan. That's how quickly the dose is, is falling off of gamma rays um, outside of the treatment volume that we're targeting. Mm -hmm. So um, now that we have a graphical analysis of how we've done in our first run through, um, we see here 99% of our tumor receives 20.2 gray. So 99% out of 100 getting I exactly what we want it to, um, pretty good. Um, and this is where the Gamma Knife once again becomes a team sport. I'm going to turn the mouse over to Dr. Tatter, and he's going to take a look and see if he can improve on what I've come up with. And while he's doing that, I'm going to call radiology and have them check through the scans for us and make sure that there's nothing there that wasn't picked up by me or Dr. Tatter in our look through the scans. And that's sort of like how we, we as a team sort of optimize the patient's care in making sure that the, treat, that the tumor that we see is treated, but also making sure that there's nothing there that wasn't noticeable before. So in this plan uh, right now, we've got 99% coverage, and uh, neurosurgeons are, are simple-minded in, in a lot of ways, so we want 100% coverage, you might say. Um, uh, and, and, but realizing that the dose outside of that yellow line is not zero. It's falling off very quickly, but the 1% of the, of the outline volume, the tumor volume that we're not covering, is still getting a dose that's very, very close to the, uh, to the prescription dose, to that 20 gray. And, and that's where um, there's still an art to it, but it's we look at it and uh, we can see um, that, that there's no part of the tumor, there's no, not 1% of the tumor that's falling far away from that yellow line. So we can be confident that 100% that of the tumor is getting more than 18 gray. And that's the dose that we want to give to control a metastasis is at least 18 gray to 100% to every single tumor cell um, to uh, give us the high rate of what we call local control that we get with the gamma knife. The gamma knife is, is great for, for treating lesions uh, that we can see, but because of the sharp drop off, uh, we're, not, we're not helping at all with anything outside of the, of the area that we're targeting. We're also treating someone today with a pituitary tumor, and the pituitary tumor presents some special uh, challenges. This particular pituitary tumor is secreting growth hormones, so we don't want to just stop the tumor from growing, but we actually want to stop it from secreting growth hormone. It causes a condition called acromegaly. If it occurs in a child, it causes gigantism. Uh, in an adult, it uh, can cause uh, continued bone growth. It makes your hands and feet grow and your joints uh, hurt and uh, causes other uh, more serious problems than that. So we want to eliminate the growth hormone production. But the problem is the pituitary is right next to the optic nerves. And uh, so we want to treat the pituitary uh, tumor to a dose of about 24 gray. But we want to let the optic nerves get less than 8 gray. We've, we've never seen someone lose vision if their optic nerves and optic chiasm, uh, where that two optic nerves come together, have gotten less than 8 gray. So you can see here our plan is to treat the pituitary adenoma that's making growth hormone. 
um, but to spare the optic nerves that are in red right above it. And, um, and in fact, we've done that. The maximum dose that the optic nerves are getting in this plan is 3.7 gray, um, and the uh, tumor is uh, completely covered by the 24 gray isodose line. And the blue line is outlining the, uh, the tumor, the treatment volume, our target volume, and the yellow line is the actual plan uh, that, we're, uh, that we've created. Uh, that's going to deliver gamma rays to that target volume while sparing the optic apparatus. Hey, Mr. Melton, Dr. Hey. Chan here. How are you doing? Mission in action. Yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize for that. So, so how are you feeling? Good. 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 Um, so one of the things that we do is we. This is like a real surgery, except that it's non-invasive. And one of the things that they do with real surgery is that they make sure that the right person is the right person and they're treating the right thing because we wouldn't want somebody else coming in to get your treatment, all right? I can understand that. Now all I right. I don't want to get nobody else's treatment. That's absolutely, right. absolutely. So this is our one of our checks to make sure. That would make, make sure. an unhappy character out of me. All <laughs> right. So do what? can you tell me your name? Charles David Mountain. Absolutely. Can you tell me your date of birth? 725. What? we will be doing is that we will be um, you know getting you into the gamma knife all right you will not feel anything when the gamma knife is on all right there's no pain you don't feel anything um, you may hear a little bit of music if there's anything you like our physicist here Al is our doubles as our DJ all oldies. right oldies we got some oldies I all can right. dig them up for you and so um, the treatment itself should probably take about 30 minutes, all right? So it's not going to be too bad. You'll be, as soon as you're done, you come out and I'm going to take that frame off of your head, all right? Best part of the day. We've looked over your plan. Looks very good, all right? We did not see any new spots, okay? All right, all right. good to go. Okay, Mr. Melton. All right, we nice. identified the right patient here. Um, <laughs> We made sure we have him in the right position. Um, when we get ready to treat him, the whole couch is going to slide up into the machine. Uh, he's going to go into an exact position that the couch is going to determine, down to the tenth of a millimeter. I think he has 11 different shots that he's going to be uh, treated, um, which are going to be obtained by the, the couch moving to these 11 different positions. Um, the whole treatment's only going to take 29 minutes. Um, he's just going to lay here and he doesn't have to do anything. His head's locked in position um, and he can just hang out and relax, take a little nap. When a patient comes in, they're seen by me, a radiation oncologist, as well as a neurosurgeon. Then they get um, presented at our multidisciplinary um, tumor clinic and so we have the team sort of decide, well, is radiosurgery the best way to go? Is fractionated radiation the best way to go? Or is surgery the best way to go? Or should maybe we watch them over time? And so it's just multi multiple opinions from physicians that have different perspectives. And that's actually really does a service to the patient because, you know, I can definitely say as a radiation doctor, there have been a number of times where my opinion has changed having had their expertise. And not every radiosurgery center is going to have that type of advantage. We're ready to send Mr. Melton in for his treatment. Okay, Mr. Melton, I'm going to send you in now. So the couch moves him to the proper position um, before the doors open as much as it can. And the, the treatment doors will open up onto the treatment unit there, we'll see. And Mr. Melton will slide into the unit. He's got 11 shots we're going to treat on him today for a total of 30 minutes or so. Everything is pretty much automated and the treatment goes uh, without me having to intervene much. The old unit, we used to have to go in in between shots and, and make all these modifications um, manually. So the patient had to get up and, and get sent back into the machine several times. So it took longer for the patient. Uh, it was much harder on them since some of them are physically you know, compromised. <clears throat> and it took longer for us to treat the patient. So we're able to treat them a lot more efficiently now. So after this five minutes um, is planned, he'll move to the second set of coordinates. And that's accomplished again by the couch just moving him uh, while he's sitting there, laying there on the couch. So it's pretty comfortable. He doesn't really move his position at all. The whole couch just moves with him on it. So he doesn't really feel any discomfort anytime they move.
Right now, he's being treated at 88.7, 86.4, and 46.8. That's the first shot, target 1-1. One, one. The next one's going to be uh, the first run, second shot. So these are the three coordinates, the X, the Y, and the Z coordinate that it'll move to. It's going to be an 8 millimeter collimator, which is the size of the holes that the radiation comes through to treat the patient. So currently we have um, four millimeter collimators out there, which is a very, that's our smallest collimator size. And the next one is going to be eight millimeters. We use a variety of different sizes of collimators to uh, treat the patients depending on the size of their lesion and the shape of the lesion. Each one of the treatments is custom designed by the, the physicians and I uh, to match the lesion shape exactly. There's a radiation detector in the room that lets us know sort of out here that, w that there's radiation in the room. So if something went wrong um, with the machine and we had to go in there, we could tell that there's radiation present in the room. Introducing the Lexal Gamma Knife Perfection. This is the newest unit in the line of Gamma Knife radiosurgical units. It has 192 sources of cobalt beam radiotherapy pointed at the same isocenter. We place this isocenter right in the tumor volume. A patient then goes in to the gamma knife unit and is positioned automatically. The unit allows us to treat multiple sites without the patient ever having to leave the unit. The advantage of gamma knife radiosurgery is that there's a very sharp dose fall off between high doses of radiation and low doses of radiation allowing us to spare normal tissues, but allow us, us to give high doses of radiation to patients' tumors. One of the advantages of the new perfection system is that because the patient positioning is fully automated, treatment times are significantly decreased as compared to previous units. For example, a treatment which treats multiple metastases, which in the past had taken up to four or five hours, can now be treated in times as little as an hour. When patients exit the gamma knife system, their head frame is removed and they can go home same day, feeling very similar to how they would on an any normal day. So they're going to change shots in 0.69 minutes or so. <clears throat> so at that time the table will move to the second position. The radiation beams will be blocked while the patient's being moved so that there's no radiation delivered okay. while he's in transit. And once the couch moves to the next position, um, the new beams open up and the radiation starts to deliver that. So I just keep an eye and make sure that the proper sequence of shots is followed, that the right um, collimators are used, the right time is, deli is delivered. So they blocked the collimators there, that's all blue. They moved to a new position, now they all popped open as, and they're eight. So they went from four millimeters to eight millimeters, and then they're gonna go back to the fours on the third shot. One of the things I do as a physicist is make sure that the table and that thing that he's attached to is properly calibrated. Um, so before each treatment, I come in in the morning and I spend about an hour working on the machine, making sure that when it says it's at a certain coordinate, um, in the machine, it, it actually is. And I have test tools that I, I hook up in there and I make measurements of each of the beams to make sure that when it says it's going to a, a particular coordinate and delivering radiation to that spot, it, it's actually there. Um, the tests require that it, it's down to within a tenth of a millimeter accuracy. So I did them this morning and it all came out zero, zero, zero deviations. It was perfectly calibrated. Um, so we do that every morning to make sure that nothing has gone awry, although there's uh, all sorts of checks and balances inside the machine to double check itself. Um, if there's any questions or any confusion in the part of the computer, it just automatically stops the treatment, kicks the patient out just for safety's sake. Then we have to go in and figure out what, what really went wrong, if anything, usually it's nothing, um, and continue the treatments then. You'll see some of the treatment, some of the shots are different times. Um, the last one we did was only 0.6 minutes. This one's about three minutes, 2.99 minutes. So we can change the shape of the radiation that we're delivering to the patient by changing the amount of time we leave on particular shots. So that's just one of the ways we uh, can modify the dose.
So now um, we're going to remove the head frame. All right. Uh, the pins come off two at a time. And that's so that the pressure coming off is equal. You tell me if you feel anything, all right? Matrix threads. I'm failed. And the last two coming off? How do you feel? Yeah. The likelihood is that today you will probably at some point during the day get a little bit of a pressure headache, all right? But tomorrow you should feel like your normal self, all right? So basically I would, what I would do is take whatever you normally take, like a Tylenol, ibuprofen for headache, and go to bed a little bit early, and tomorrow you really should feel like your normal self, all right? That could be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> and what I will do now is I'm going to just uh, wipe the um, pinhole sites with a little bit of alcohol to clean them. We're going to okay. put some antibiotic ointment inside to make sure they don't get infected. We'll get sure I'll be out in just a minute. It's kind of loose. Yeah, I see. Harder tight pass. So the plan will be to see you back in about six weeks, all right? You'll see me. You'll get an MRI here. And what we'll do is... Um, You'll, after you, you'll get the MRI and I'll tell you the same day what the MRI shows, all right? If that's clear, so meaning nothing new shows up, then statistically we know we're safe to scan you every three months, all right? If anything shows up that's new um, in six weeks, we would have to do something about that, all right? And we'll talk about that when the time comes. But, um, you know, we're keeping our fingers crossed and hope that the scan's clean in six weeks, all right? Um, the key is because we do the scan at six weeks, if anything new shows up, that means we catch it early, all right? Mm -hmm. And so when you catch things early in the brain, the likelihood of success is, is going to be high in terms of treating that and, uh, successfully, all right? And so we, what we do is it, what we call like keeping you on a short leash at the beginning, all right? And then once we show over time that there aren't other ones popping up, then we can drag that out a little bit. What we generally do is we, we uh, have our nurses and therapists go over with the patient exactly what to do in case something were to come up in the next few days after radio surgery. So say all of a sudden they develop this really bad headache and nausea. It's not unheard of and basically the reason for that is that when you give radio surgery a high dose of radiation, sometimes the body reacts with some inflammation in that general area. And so with inflammation in the brain, you can have increased pressure in the brain and the, you feel it with a headache or nausea or vomiting. And so we make sure the patients know that they are to call if they develop any symptoms that are new or, un, un, you know, they don't know why it's happening. And the likelihood is that, you know, things like that can generally be controlled with a short course of steroids. But we give them the knowledge to know when to call and also how to get a hold of us. The experience was a whole lot more pleasant than I was expecting it to be. Everything's been very nice here. Good doctors and answer all your questions and everybody's friendly. What we'll um, then do is we like to follow the patients up. And so in general with brain metastases, we'll follow them up at six weeks. And the reason for getting them back so soon is just to make sure that they're not one of those patients that have multiple brain metastases on their way, all right? Because if that's the case, then the likelihood is maybe they might benefit from whole brain radiation, all right? But if that scan is clean at six weeks, we generally say, well, you know, we've had the, 
the first scan showed one metastasis, the treatment planning scan didn't show anything new, and then now six weeks later, it's once again nothing new, we can say, well, the likelihood is we can go every three months and be able to still catch anything when it's small and then follow them up over time at three monthly intervals. How are you feeling? Great. Good. Great. Do you remember how long did it take for the pain to go away after this second gamma knife treatment? Uh, approximately six weeks, I would say. And that's exactly yeah. the average. So the median oh, really? time for someone to become pain free after gamma knife is six weeks. Were you taking any medications for your trigeminal neuralgia? At that time, the first one? Uh, the second one. The second one. Yes, we what, were. What were you taking? Do you remember? I should, but. Isn't that when we got started on Lyrica? Lyrica. Mm -hmm. And then did you just come off the Lyrica gradually? We drew mm -hmm. this graph that said that if you have gamma knife uh, once, our chance of success right away is about 15%. And then mm -hmm. by the time we get out to about uh, six weeks, half of people are, are free of the pain. Mm -hmm. And then uh, by about nine months, pretty much everyone who's going to respond has responded. But then over time, there's a chance it'll come back. When we do our second one, the, the curve looks better, mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're hoping that, uh, that this will keep you free of pain for, for a much longer period of time. But if it doesn't, we want to know, and uh, we'll go mm -hmm. over what all the mm -hmm. options are again. And we compared it to one of the options, the microvascular decompression operation, mm -hmm. when, we, when we talked before. Do you have any numbness at all in your face? Very little. I think I feel just a slight around my chin area. Yeah, and, and that, that could still uh, still become more prominent. It's mm. interesting when we look at it, it correlates with being free of the pain. So we like oh, to say yeah. it's, a, it's a positive thing in, in some ways to have a little bit of numbness. Dr. Tatter and the staff uh, was very, very good about everything. You know, I mean, they explained everything to us all the procedures, uh, just, uh, just couldn't do enough for you. I mean, as far as explaining things to you and letting you know how things were gonna work and exactly what they were gonna do and how long it would take and, uh, you know, you knew exactly what to expect and it worked real well. Everything went great, great. A person like Dr. Tatter and his staff and everybody can fix you right up, you know. It makes a world of difference. I mean, you know, you're certainly glad you came here. <laughs> I know that, for sure. Thank you for joining us for this webcast about our new Perfection Gamma Knife here at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center. Thanks a lot for watching.